Okay, good day. I'm Eve and this is Josie. And we're here from Sydney, Australia to talk to you about dependency management. Uh, before we start, we wanted to give you some background on who we are. So Josie and I are on the Google Open Source Security Team, or GHOST for short. And our aim is to make open source secure at scale. GHOST works on and contributes to projects like the OpenSSF Scorecard, Solsa, OSV, and Depths.dev. We aim to provide tools and standards to help keep open, software, open source software secure. Things like vulnerability management, build system security standards, and project security posture assessments. The project that we specifically work on is Depths.dev. Depths.dev looks at open source package dependency management with the aim of helping consumers and maintainers to better understand and work with their dependencies. We collect and analyze data about millions of open source packages from across the NPM, Go, Maven, PyPI, Nougat, and Cargo ecosystems. We make this data freely available via a website, a BigQuery dataset, and an API. And what we're presenting today is based on the analysis that the depths.dev team has done and our experience working with open source dependencies. You'll see some screenshots of dependency graphs for real packages throughout, and these are taken from the depths.dev website. Understanding your open source software and its dependencies is really important because open source continues to grow. According to the ninth annual software supply chain report by Sonatype, just last year, over 60 million new versions of open source packages were published. And while much of this growth is well-intentioned developers and enterprises sharing code for others to use and benefit from, it's also undeniable that there are more malicious packages being published than ever before. So last year, over 245,000 malicious packages were discovered, which is two times all the previous years combined since 2019. As the number of software supply chain attacks increases, it's less a question of if your project will get exposed to a vulnerability than what to do when your project inevitably gets exposed to a vulnerability. Unfortunately, remediating vulnerabilities is something that many projects struggle to do. The same report found that while 39% of organizations mitigate vulnerabilities within one day and one week, another 39% remediate vulnerabilities between one week and never. There's obviously a good incentive to remediate vulnerabilities. So why aren't our remediation strategies able to keep up with the vulnerabilities that our projects are being exposed to? To see why, let's take a look at the, the vulnerability remediation timelines for two compromised open source packages across two different package management ecosystems, starting with the Maven Log4j package. So many of you will probably have heard of the Log4Shell vulnerability, and I hope this doesn't bring, bring back too many bad memories for you. But just in case you haven't, Log4Shell was a zero-day remote code execution vulnerability in a popular Java logging framework called Log4j. And when it was discovered at the end of 2021, it affected more than 35,000 packages, which amounts to over 8% of all packages on the Maven Central repository. Even though most of the ecosystem today has been fixed, thanks to the coordinated efforts of many thousands of people across the Maven ecosystem, it still took one week to fix 13% of affected packages, 10 days to fix 25% of affected packages, a few months to fix 40% of affected packages. And as late at the, as the end of 2022, 30% of affected packages still remained unfixed. Let's compare this to an incident in NPM that also required remediation. In early January 2022, the developer of the popular NPM packages Colors and Faker intentionally published several releases that contained breaking changes. At the time of the incident, around 50,000 packages had a dependency on one of the affected versions. Based off the previous example, you might guess that remediating this issue took months or even years. But actually the incident from vulnerability introduction to remediation took place in just three days. That's such a significant difference that it's hard to even visualize accurately on this timeline. So why did it take months for Log4Shell, but only a few days for Colors? How were the packages in NPM able to be remediated so much faster than the Maven packages? Well, spoiler alert, the answer is dependency management. 
Um, and more specifically, it's the different approaches that each ecosystem takes to dependency management. Before we get deeper into the specifics of these incidents, let's take a step back and talk through some of dependency management's key concepts. Today we're going to talk about what is dependency resolution, what a typical dependency graph probably looks like across ecosystems, and how dependency graphs can change over time. We'll then get into exactly how dependency management affects vulnerability remediation, and we'll conclude by looking at some solutions for managing dependency graphs at scale. A vital part of dependency management that is sometimes underappreciated is the role of dependency resolution. So say you're making a web app or some other project represented by this package A, and you want to depend on another package. That could be your web framework, your testing framework, whatever it is. Let's call that package, package B. Um, you specify your dependency on B in the form of requirements. So here my project A depends on package B at any version greater than or equal to 1.5. It's then the responsibility of the dependency resolution tool to take those requirements, look at the available versions, look at the available versions and then determine which one should be included in your dependency graph. Each language ecosystem has its own dependency resolution tools, some of them um, you may be familiar with, um, like GoMod, Cargo install, Nougat add, pip install, and so on. Um, it's the job of these tools to resolve requirements into concrete versions. Here there's only one version of B that matches the requirement greater than or equal to 1.5, and that's the, version that, that's the version that ends up being chosen, 1.5.1. But the dependency resolution algorithm has to take into account not just the direct dependencies of your project, but also their dependencies, their dependencies, their dependencies as well. And you'll notice that we've been talking about a, de a dependency graph, not a dependency tree. And that's because your dependencies can have common dependencies. So here A has added another dependency on X at version greater than or equal to one. And X also has a dependency on C. So now rather than just taking the single constraint on C into account, the resolver has to satisfy the constraints from both B and X. In this scenario, there are a few different versions of X that could satisfy the greater than or equal to one constraint. And each of these versions of X has a slightly different requirement on C. So let's walk through each of them and see how bringing in that version would affect the resolution graph. Say the resolution algorithm selects the oldest version of X, that's version one. We now have both B and C depending, sorry, B, we now have both B and X, sorry, depending on C with the same constraint greater than or equal to two. So the resolution algorithm can just select version two. But what if our algorithm selected a slightly newer version of X, version one one? Um, this new version has a dependency on C at any version greater than or equal to 2, 1. So now when the resolution runs, the algorithm has to select a later version of C that matches both of these constraints, greater than or equal to 2 and greater than or equal to 2, 1. Um, again, we can find a version like 2, 1 of C that would satisfy both these constraints. Um, and notice that the constraint introduced by X is actually bumping up the version that gets selected in the graph. And if the latest version of X is selected, version 1.2, then X is now depending on C with the requirement of equal to 101, which conflicts with the other requirement. And we call that the diamond dependency problem. So to solve this conflict, the resolution tool may actually try to decide to try another version of B. Maybe another version of B won't have this conflicting constraint on C, or maybe there's a version of B that doesn't depend on C at all. I hope you're getting the idea now that your resolver is doing a fair bit of work. And in fact, if you're someone who did CompSci and you think back to your algorithms class, you may remember that dependency resolution is an NP complete problem because it's a form of the constraint satisfaction problem. So what this means is that any true solution must kind of brute force. Um, a true solution can't do any better than go through all possible combinations of package versions one by one and check whether the, cons the combination satisfies all the given requirements. You can imagine that this takes a long time and in depths.dev we have seen some package dependency resolutions out there that take hours to complete. So to get around this, some resolvers change the definition of the problem. 
In NPM, the resolver allows for packages to be installed multiple times at different versions. So here you can see that there are two conflicting constraints, um, greater than or equal to two and 101. And the result is that there are two versions installed, two and 101. <coughs> this may be the first time you've heard of a constraint satisfaction problem, but you're probably already familiar with one, and that's the puzzle game Sudoku. In a Sudoku, each cell holds a number from one to nine, but not just any number. The rules are that if um, a cell has a number, say five, none of the other cells in the row can be five, none of the other cells in the column can be five, and none of the other cells in the square can be five. Initially, only some numbers are filled in, and to solve the Sudoku, you need to fill in the rest of the numbers. So usually when you start solving Sudokus, you start by solving the easier ones, where many numbers are filled in initially, and everything can be inferred from the starting numbers. But as you start doing harder ones, um, you reach states where simple elimination won't help you. You need to start guessing a number, fill in all the numbers implied by that guess, and then see if you come to a contradiction. If you do, you then erase everything you filled in since that guess, and then guess a different number. But how is this the same problem as dependency resolution? The nine by nine can be a bit to visualize, quite a lot to visualize. So to show you how it works, let's take a simpler example of a two by two Sudoku. In the two by two, the rules are a lot more simple. The only numbers available are zero and one. And the only rules are that the number in the cell cannot be the same as any numbers in the same row and column as it. So if there's a zero in the top left cell, which I've labeled as cell A, the cells in the same row and column can't be zero, which means there must be one. And the final empty square can't be a one as there are ones in the same column and row as it, so it must be zero. And that's how, how the two by two works. Um, to see how this translates to dependency resolution and package requirements, um, we see that the problem started off with the top left cell labeled as A, and that cell contains zero. If we think about the cells as being packages and the number in the cell as the version, this is like having a constraint on package A that specifies the exact version zero. Cell B is in the same row as A, and cell C is in the same column as A, so they can't be zero. In dependency resolution terms, this is saying this is like saying that the package A at version zero has requirements of not equal to zero and packages B and C. The constraint not equal to zero then leaves only one other possible number, as in a two by two Sudoku, only two numbers are possible. So version one is chosen for packages B and C. However, the versions B and C at one also have requirements on D, and, those, and that requirement is that D must not be one, so the only option that we have is zero. So we pick version zero, and that's our solution for the two by two Sudoku. And it's the same principle for the nine by nine. Um, it's just bigger and has more constraints, but it's still the same constraint satisfaction problem. So if that cell on the top left that we've calculated, sorry, that we've called AA is equal to one, the constraints of the package AA at version one are that nothing in the same row can be one, nothing in the same column can be one, and nothing in the same square can be one. At devs.dev, we've re-implemented some resolvers bug for bug in Go. Um, we've, we use Sudoku as a test case for our PyPI resolver, and it was able to solve it. So your resolver is doing a fair bit of work. It's trying to solve an NP-complete um, problem. And when you do vulnerability remediation, um, you're trying to reverse engineer this complex resolution logic that your resolver is doing so that you can bring in fixed versions of packages into your graph. And that's one reason why remediation isn't easy. But it gets even more complex than that, because even though 9 by 9 Sudokus are more complex than 2 by 2 Sudokus, in real life dependency resolution, there can be hundreds if not thousands of versions for a package and there are often hundreds of packages in a dependency graph. So what does a typical dependency graph look like? So far we've looked at some simple dependency graph examples, but these are not quite representative of what the average open source dependency graph looks like. For example, in NPM, the average package version has only six direct dependencies compared to an average of 110 indirect dependencies. And we see this play, play out across many of the ecosystems that we track in depths.dev. For each ecosystem, in blue is the average number of direct dependencies, and in red is the average number of indirect, or also known as transitive, dependencies. Um, so you can see that the dependency graph size blowout comes from those red indirect dependencies. Um, in Cargo, that's the Rust ecosystem, the average pack package is six direct, but has 60 indirect. Um, and in Maven, Java, 
Um, it's about an average of six direct versus 33 indirect dependencies. So a typical dependency graph you might encounter in the wild probably looks a bit like this. This is the dependency graph for the NPM Minimalist Web Framework Express. Um, you can search this package on the depths.dev website, click the dependencies tab and see this visualization there. Although if you're really unlucky, your graph might look something more like this. This is the dependency graph for, Go, uh, for the Go Kubernetes module at version 128.1. And obviously this looks a bit ridiculous. Um, and yes, there may have been a clearer way to uh, visualize this, but the purpose of showing you this graph is to give you a sense of complexity of dependency graphs that are out there. Because all ecosystems that we analyze, um, and that's because all the ecosystems that we analyze have packages, important packages that have dependency graphs containing thousands of versions. So you can imagine how difficult it would be to comb through a graph like that to um, identify vulnerabilities and licensing risks. Large dependency graphs make it hard to identify and remediate vulnerabilities, but big dependency graphs are just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, dependency management in practice is more complicated because dependency graphs change over time. So let's, um, to see why, let's take a look at open requirements and see how they affect your graph. We categorize, we can categorize requirements into two broad categories, pinned and open. Pinned requirements specify exact versions. Examples of pinned requirements are on the left. Um, and different ecosystems have different syntax for pinned requirements and different behavior if the exact version doesn't exist. Open requirements allow for room to change. So for all these requirements on the right, there are multiple versions that can satisfy them. Except for NPM, all of these examples of requirements mean that mean to accept any version greater than or equal to one. In NPM, the caret operator is uh, a very common way of specifying open requirements. It means to accept any version um, with major version one. Um, this particular requirement means to um, accept any version with major version one. Um, in other words, any version greater than or equal to one, but less than two. So when there are multiple valid versions that satisfy the requirement, what should the resolver choose? So here we've got the requirement on B of greater than or equal to 1.5, and there are two valid versions that satisfy it. Should it prefer the oldest or newest version possible? Go and Nougat, um, they prefer the oldest version that matches, in this case 1.5. The idea is that the dependency graph is less likely to change and that vulnerabilities and bugs from latest versions won't be automatically picked up. But other tools, like the NPM resolver, um, prefer the newest version that matches, in this case 1.6. The idea being that the latest version will have latest bug fixes and latest features. So which is the better choice? We would like to say that one is clearly better than the other, but in reality, there isn't a clear answer. There are pros and cons to each. So let's take a look at how latest version selection works out in NPM. Um, so as a reminder, caret 100 means any version with major part one. And as explained previously, um, the NPM resolver defaults to selecting the latest version. So I wanna try and figure out what package A depends on. So I run NPM install and I get the following graph. Um, both satisfy one, but we end up picking the latest version. But what if B introduces a new version, say 102? Now again, I want to figure out what my project depends on. So I run um, another fresh run of NPM install. And this time, the version that gets selected is 102. And that might not seem like a huge change, but it can have an immense flow on effect, especially in large dependency graphs. Because the dependencies of 102 are specified independently to, the to those of the previous version. It might introduce new dependencies or delete old dependencies. And this isn't just a hypothetical situation. Here's the proportion of versions within NPM and PyPI that have had a graph change each day over March this year. And it varies from just a few to 25%. That's 25% of all package versions within NPM or PyPI having a different resolution result to the day before, which is a lot of change. Um, and it's a change in your dependent and, and a change in your dependencies is important because it can mean a change in your license and advisory sets. So 40,000 of the 22 million NPM package versions see a change in their license or vulnerability set every day. So that could be a new vulnerability or if you're lucky, a vulnerability that's been patched. So if you're someone who is working to manage that license set or advisory set for your project or organization at scale, props to you. It's, it's not easy. 
Um, so we've seen that dependency graphs change over time, which leads to license and vulnerability sets changing over time. And what this means is that when we're thinking about our dependency graphs or our licenses or advisories, we need to be conscious that it's something that we need to keep maintaining. It's not enough to vet our dependencies just once and then forget about them. Just because my project doesn't have a vulnerable dependency today doesn't mean that it won't have a vulnerable dependency tomorrow. Okay, so we've seen that the dependency graphs you're managing are complex, that they're big, and that they may change significantly from day to day. But why does that matter? And how do these properties of dependency graphs affect us in the real world? So as we've, as we've said, a changing dependency graph can mean many things, such as changing licenses and changing behavior. But now let's focus specifically on how it affects vulnerability remediation. The vast majority of the time, when your project is affected by a vulnerability, it is affected indirectly. So the problem isn't in your code, it's in the code contained in your dependency graph. And in fact, in depths.dev, we've seen that 98% of the time, when a package is affected by a security vulnerability, it's affected indirectly. Let's dive a bit deeper into how the complexities involved in dependency graphs make remediating any vulnerabilities in that graph difficult. To do so, we need to understand how requirements are typically specified in an ecosystem and how this will affect remediation. So for example, let's take how projects in the Maven ecosystem specify their requirements. Of the nearly 67 million requirements we analyzed in Maven, we saw a pretty clear preference. 99% of requirements in Maven specified an exact version number, and we call this pinning. So an exact version number on say 1.0 in Maven means to select 1.0, and then if that version doesn't exist, I can pick a later version. But in 98% of cases, resolving this requirement will give you the specified version. Now let's compare how these types of requirements can affect what remediation looks like when you're affected by a vulnerability. So here is a project that depends on an affected version of a package A. To pull in a fix, a newer unaffected version of A needs to be published. And then you need to update your requirement file to specify that newer version. Sometimes these packages don't follow Semba and can break your tests but let's just assume that this package does use Semba and you are able to just bump the version. But when you're indirectly affected by a vulnerability in B, um, in order for you to pull in the fix, a newer unaffected version of B needs to be published, and then A needs to publish a new version that specifies the unaffected version of B, and then you need to update your project to specify that newer version of A as a direct dependency. And that's the key difference between direct and indirect vulnerabilities. Indirect vulnerabilities require you to depend on package maintainer action. In this case, the maintainers of A and B. And you can imagine what this would look like if the vulnerability is more packages away from you. Uh, in this case, four. Remediating a vulnerability in D would require new versions of A, B, C, and D to be published and then your project and also A, B, and C need to update their requirements to require the unaffected version of the child package. And you can see that that's a lot of work for a lot of maintainers. The overhead required to do these indirect vulnerability remediations with these types of requirements has real world effects. The log for shell vulnerability was a really great example of why the often indirect nature of vulnerability introduction can make remediation so dif difficult. From analyzing this security incident in depths.dev, we saw that one of the reasons that this vulnerability was so difficult to remediate was because it was affecting packages so deep in their dependency graphs. To break it down, of all the, pa the packages in the Maven ecosystem that were affected by the vulnerability in log4j, only 20% of them were affected at depth one. But that means that 80% of the time, log4j was introduced indirectly. And because of the overhead required for so many maintainers to introduce new versions and new requirements, it took a really long time for packages to move off of affected versions. As we saw at the beginning, as late as the end of 2022, over a year after log4shell was discovered, 30% of affected packages still remained unfixed. 
So you can see why indirect issues take longer to fix than issues in your direct dependencies, and particularly so if you're using pinned requirements. But you may be thinking that there are solutions to this problem. In Go, for example, rather than needing new versions of all these packages to be published, you can just directly specify the patched version of D from your project. So that would look something like this. No new versions of A, B, or C needed to be published. Another solution in ecosystems like NPM is to use open requirements. Across all NPM packages, 74% or approximately three quarters of requirements are open requirements. So as we said before, that means that a newer version of a dependency will be used when one is available. And as an aside, you can guess that these trends within each package ecosystem are very dependent on what the default requirement is when you install a package in that ecosystem. Uh, so as open requirements are the norm in NPM, vulnerability remediation looks a bit different than what it did in Maven. Rather than needing new versions of A, B, and C to be published, the flexibility in the requirement on D from C would automatically be able to pull in the fixed version. So think about how Log4Shell would have played out if it was in the NPM ecosystem. Three quarters of all Log4J users would have automatically pulled in the newer patched version. Log4J happened in Maven um, and not in NPM, so we'll never know what it really would have been like but we can look at a similar incident that did happen in NPM and see how it played out. As we mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in early January 2022, the developer of the popular NPM packages Colors and Faker intentionally published several releases that contained breaking changes. These were picked up rapidly due to the norm that we saw in NPM of using those open requirements and the way that the NPM resolution algorithm preferences recent releases. The graph here shows the dependency flow in the ecosystem over the 72 hours where all the action happened. Uh, on the X axis, we have time. And on the Y axis, we have the number of packages in NPM that were depending on various versions, some affected and some unaffected. You can see about half, so that's the green half at the bottom, remained using unaffected earlier versions but uh, it's in the top half that you see some movement. At the time of the incident, more than 100,000 packages most recent releases depended on colors, and around half of them, that's 50,000 packages, had a dependency on an affected version. In fact, shortly after the first, ver the first affected version 141 was introduced, another similarly affected version was introduced. And many packages actually quickly moved onto that new version the same day, due to the way that NPM is choosing that highest version. But we can also see this jagged curve where more people are moving to unaffected versions of the colors package, in this case, usually 1.4. People were beginning to pin to unaffected versions of colors or just moving off the package entirely until eventually NPM pulled the package off the registry. For comparison with log4shell, this whole chart from vulnerability introduction to remediation takes place within just three days. So you can see that the vulnerability was mitigated really quickly. But why did it take months for log4shell, but only a few days for colors? The key lies in the number of the maintainer actions that were needed to mitigate these issues. Just a little over 1% of the affected packages that depended on colors actually made a release during this time period but their work resulted in 43% of the total affected packages mitigating the issue. This was because these open requirements were allowing fixes to propagate really fast through the ecosystem. So does this mean that all project owners should, choose all, should change all their dependency requirements to be open requirements and all resolvers should start choosing the latest version? Unfortunately, like everything else in dependency management, it's a bit more complicated than that. As a counter example of how open requirements might actually cause problems, let's take a look at the event stream attack. Event stream is a helper package for working with streaming data, but it hadn't been in development for a couple of years. Its author had a lot of other things on their plate, so they let maintenance of the package fall by the wayside. When a user contacted the author and offered to take over the project, 
the author of Eventstream understandably saw it as an opportunity to shed some responsibility and handed ownership over to this person. The problem was, um, as you may have guessed, that the person offering to help was a hacker. And they used their ownership of the project to make a new release of Eventstream that contained a malicious payload. The latest legitimate version of the package had been published about two years ago and was version 3.3.5. The malicious actor published the new vulnerable version as version 3.3.6. And as NPM is an ecosystem that automatically updates to the latest version, projects started picking up that latest vulnerable version 336 by default. The hack actually wasn't discovered for two months, and it was only eventually discovered because of a small error that the attacker made. As EventStream is a popular package, by the time the hack was discovered, the vulnerable version had been downloaded millions of times and been executed millions more. If this had been a Maven package, where dependencies were not automatically updated to the latest version, would the hack have had such a broad effect? So we can see that there are good and bad things about pinned versus open requirements. Pinned requirements mean that you have more control over your dependencies. You don't automatically pick up vulnerabilities and breaking changes. The graph doesn't change under your feet. It changes on your terms when you manually update the requirements. On the other hand, Open requirements allow you to automatically pick up the good stuff quickly, like bug fixes and vulnerability patches. But of course, it can also automatically pick up the bad stuff. And this is an idea that comes up again and again when we look at effective dependency management. We wish we could tell you that open requirements or pinned requirements were clearly the better choice. But unfortunately, because of the, the complexities of dependency graph, there just is no silver bullet solution. Rather, whatever we decide, whether that's about open or pin requirements, or about one of the many other choices that you need to make when managing your dependencies, that choice is gonna come with a set of pros and cons, of risks and rewards, and of compromises and trade-offs. And just like in any other aspect of engineering, you need to evaluate that choice based on the profile of your specific project or organization. So something that we hope has become clear throughout this presentation is the huge scale at which um, these dependency graphs are operating. And we saw that dependency graphs can have tens of thousands of dependencies. Um, they, can change, they can change rapidly over time. And the way that you remediate can be different, different depending on what ecosystem you're working in. So with the scale and complexity of these graphs, we need to go beyond managing these dependencies manually. We need automated scalable solutions. These are some tools outside of your resolver to help you manage your dependencies. And we'll take a look at a few of them, OSV Scanner, OpenSSF Scorecard, and, some, and the depths.dev API. OSV Scanner is a command line tool that gives you a summary for, of any known vulnerabilities on packages listed in your lock files, mod files, whatever those are in the language that you're using. Um, here I'm running OSV Scanner on an old version of Memos, a popular self-hosted Memo Hub. And we can see um, from the output of this table that the version is affected by several vulnerabilities in both Go and NPM. More than that, um, for the Go vulnerabilities, these are split into called and uncalled vulnerabilities. Um, where called identifies that the vulnerable code is actually being executed or, or could be executed by your project. Um, so from here, as a developer, I have a clear understanding of what my next step should be and where to prioritize my efforts. And in fact, OSV Scanner now does even more than just help you identify vulnerable dependencies. Because um, as we've highlighted, um, the sheer number of dependencies and the complex nature of de uh, dependency resolution makes it difficult for developers to dig into their dependency graph and remediate those. Um, so, to see, so to help with this, OSV Scanner has just launched support for guided remediation. And the command automatically fixes as many vulnerabilities as possible by upgrading a project's dependencies um, or provides a small number of actionable steps for maintainers to take. And it includes features like re-resolution of the entire dependency graph, leveraging devs.dev, to determine the minimal changes required to remove vulnerabilities. Um, it also helps with prioritizing direct dependency upgrades by the total number of transitive vulnerabilities fixed. And it also allows you to filter out vulnerabilities that you might not care about. For example, you may filter by a specific ID, CVSS score, and interestingly, um, dependency depth. 
But vulnerabilities are just one of many things that you want to be scanning for. You probably want to keep scanning for licenses, general package health checks, and so on. The Scorecard project runs fully automated checks um, for more than a million repos across GitHub and collects this package health information for you to be able to look at at a glance. So the checks include things like whether um, tests are run in continuous integration, whether there are at least two contributors from different organizations, whether they sign releases, whether there have been any um, recent commits on the project and so on. We display the scorecard checks on depths.dev among other information like dependencies, dependency graphs, dependency licenses, and dependence. And we also serve this information to our API, which is free. Um, so for example, if you wanted to build a tool that prevents any packages with a failing scorecard check, like no code review from being checked into main, you could build a tool using the depths dev API to check for this specific scorecard check um, in all your packages, in all your lock file packages, for example, and determine and use that to determine whether to fail the pre-submit. We also make depths.dev information available in our BigQuery data set for ecosystem-wide analysis. And in fact, this data set is how we produced a lot of the statistics that were included in this presentation. Um, so in conclusion, dependency resolution is complicated. Dependency graphs are big in terms of the number de of dependencies and change over time. These things combined make it hard to fix issues like security vulnerabilities in your dependencies. So to do dependency management effectively, we need scalable solutions. Thanks for listening to our talk and feel free to reach out to us at depthsdev at google.com. Any questions? Um, is there a mock? Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, that's a really good point. That's um, yeah, absolutely true. That not uh, that having open dependencies means that um, it's really difficult to reproduce builds, and they will just things will just change like month to month. It's definitely a good point. <laughs> Wait, sorry, what was the question? So, yeah, so um, sometimes dependency managers want to run a fast check to open the dependency. Yeah. But you don't want to actually depend on that. You only want to look at the string. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, I see. Oh, very cool. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if there are any ones. I'm not sure how Go, for example, works if the the dependency that you pin in your like Go file at the top level project, if that goes away. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, we can look into it. Yeah, on that note about um, pinned versus open, um, we typically suggest that applications pin and libraries don't pin because um, with libraries, the consumer of the library, the user of the library might need that flexibility on that requirement to say, um, bump it um, rather than waiting for your um, for you to release a new version with new requirements that no longer um, that removes the vulnerability from your graph yeah um, that is what we typically say but definitely um, if your requirements open then it does mean that your graph continually changes yeah in many cases go ahead Very cool. 
I missed that. Could you repeat it, Eve? Oh, sorry. So I think NPM um, or Yarn or maybe both have a feature that is what we were talking about before where you can override the uh, uh, later yep. dependencies. Yep. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we'll be around if anyone wants to come and has any other comments or questions. Thank you.